Well, hello. I'm Jared Kearney. I'm the assistant director and the curator of the James Monroe Museum. And today we're going to do a first uh, curator live. So I'm going to show you uh, three different artifacts that belong to Elizabeth Monroe. And uh, let's nerd out. Let's, uh, let's dive right into it. So um, the first thing I'm going to show you is, let's see here. I'm going to show you this right here. Let's see if you can get a good view of this. Now this here is a Nasser. And so what's going on with this? What is this thing? What's going on? Uh, well, the Nasser is sort of like a cross between a purse and a Swiss army knife. Um, so it was sort of the, uh, the all-purpose purse uh, for ladies uh, of the uh, 1700s and 1800s. Um, and this one in particular belonged to Elizabeth Monroe. Um, it's in gilded, uh, it's uh, cast in brass and gilded, um, and it's in a cartouche shape here. Um, and so what's kind of interesting about it, though, is what is inside. It's kind of cool. So let's take a look. Let's see what's in here. And whoa, all right, so what do we got going there? There's a whole bunch of stuff going on in there. Um, I'm going to pull out these different items, and I'm going to show them to you uh, so you can check it out. They're pretty cool. Uh, the first thing I'll show you right here. If you can see this, it's a little tiny spoon, and yes, that is a little spoon that belonged into the uh, Nasser. Show you this right here. Let's see if I can find it. This one's kind of interesting. This is actually sort of a, an artifact in of itself. This here, can you see that? That is a slab of ivory. It's a whole little piece of ivory. So what is that? Why, why is this in there? What is it? Well, it's sort of like a memo pad. Uh, so it's a way for ladies to uh, take notes. Um, and so often they would, use, uh, they would use graphite pencils and they would write on there. And you might ask yourself, well, graphite, you know, wouldn't that sort of wear off really quick? Well, man, nah, sort of. But if you ever uh, have an outdoor plant, do an experiment. Um, take a pen, right, and write it on the plastic uh, write it on a plastic tab and then write the same thing on a pencil and just leave it outside for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Eventually the pen will run out, but the graphite will stay on there. So it's really pretty cool. Um, so they actually can write on here and it would actually last and then they can just sort of, uh, you know, erase it off. But yeah, so that is a little tiny, <laughs> believe it or not, a little tiny memo pen. That's what that actually is. Um, okay, so let's see what else we have in here. Okay. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> Look at that. So that, can you see that? That is a little, tiny little fork. It's the cutest little thing ever. And I'll show you its companion piece, actually. Let's see if I can find it. There we go. And there's a knife. So you got a little fork and a little knife, and lo and behold, you have an extender for them to fit on too. <laughs> so it's the cutest thing. So you put the little extender piece right on the end like that. Can you see that? And you put it right in there and you have yourself an emergency little tiny, uh, little tiny <laughs> um, knife and fork set. So to travel with. So I just think that's amazing. Um, oh, and here's another spoon, another little tiny spoon. In addition to this one here, little, little baby spoon. It's the cutest thing ever. Okay, Let's see if I can pull this out here. So the thing that I wanted to sort of save for the last is this right here. <laughs> can you see that? If anyone could guess what that is, you're, you're awesome. But I, I, what it is actually, is it's actually, it's not a little tiny spoon and it's nothing to do with crochet or anything. That actually is an ear scoop, believe it or not, to clean out your ears. And yes, it is made out of cast brass, and it's the craziest thing ever. Um, so they, and they actually did use them, and I looked it up. People actually did get injured by these things uh, back in the day. So you can imagine sticking it in your ear and sort of cleaning out your ear and all the chaos that would erupt from that happening. <laughs> so, but hey, they would use it. So this would be part of the little Nasser project actually here. And it's not in here, it's actually in a separate piece. But for th this sort of thing could be made, you know, just as easily in England as it could be in France. 
Um, and so we didn't really know, you know, right away which one this came from. Is it England or France or where is it from? But actually, um, there's actually a metric uh, ruler on the inside of it. And of course, the metric system was only used by France and, and or it wasn't, was not used by England even back in the day. So um, it would have been uh, definitely uh, French. So this was a French origin. And this is something that she would have carried with her. Um, you know, she would have carried it around in different social circumstances. Um, she would have brought it to her whenever uh, she went with James Monroe over on his diplomatic trips to, uh, to France and to England. And so this was kind of a cool little thing to have. It was sort of a, it was, it was also a little bit of a status symbol. So if you can imagine, it was, it was a way to sort of say, you know, hey, I have something kind of cool with me. Um, kind of in, you know, sort of maybe similar to someone wearing a watch or something like that, an expensive watch or, or jewelry or something along those lines. But yeah, there it is. Cartouche right there. It's the cutest thing ever. It's really well decorated. I don't know if you can see it, but it has some really cool uh, decorations on there, cast. So what, what they would have done is the craftsman would have carved out originally a cast mold of this, and he would have done all these delicate carvings in the original mold, and or in the original cast, and then they would have done, uh, it's probably sand wax cast, and, and they would have uh, casted it out, so they would have had this for um, to make multiple times. So this wasn't the case where someone actually came in and folded it around and and actually uh, and, and did it for each individual one. This actually was cast. So there it is, Elizabeth Monroe's cartouche. It's kind of a cool thing. And all right, so the next thing I want to show you is this. This is kind of cool. So if you could see that, that is Elizabeth Monroe's perfume bottle, and that's actually what that is. Um, it's really kind of interesting because when you look at artifacts, uh, something that's kind of really cool about them is they, some of them are vastly different, right? There's some things that are vastly different, like what I just showed you. Okay, so this ivory slab that I showed you earlier, this is vastly different than we would have something today, right? Like today, if we want to write down a note, we have you know, paper pads or we have, we have texts, we have little note things on our phones and that sort of thing, but, but that is it. But that is something that's different, but then something that's more or less more or less the same is perfume bottles, right? You know, perfume bottles, they won't actually, um, they won't actually, uh, hmm, they, they, they change a little bit according to style. Sometimes you see whimsical ones, but really if you think about it, a lot of the classic shapes still maintain, right? So, I mean, if you look at this, this is eight-sided, right? It's an octagon. You can see on the bottom, it's an octagon there, and it's made out of crystal, or crystal, some people say, no, crystal, um, crystal glass. Um, in fact, a lot of people say, okay, well, what's the difference between crystal glass and regular glass? Well, crystal glass has a lot higher lead content, right? So there's a lot higher lead in there. In fact, it's kind of cool. Um, you could tell if your wine glass is made of crystal or if your date brought out the cheap stuff by, you know, you do the little ring around the top, you go, like that. Oh, hey, Scott. Um, you do the little ring around the top, and if it makes that sound, then it's crystal. And if it doesn't, well, you know, it might be just regular glass. But that's what that is, is crystal. And silver on top, right? You also still, to this day, see a lot of silver. Um, and so if you think about it, that really hasn't changed a whole lot, um, whereas some, some things really have changed. Something that I find vastly interesting about this piece is that for a long time, a uh, museum, they thought it was Dutch, or excuse me, thought it was French. Makes sense, it, you know, it's sort of, you know, French, uh, they, they produced a lot of these. This is about um, 1812, something like that. And so they produced a lot of these around those time period. But, you know, when I took a magnifying glass and did my little nerdness on it, um, and I looked really, really closely at it, it actually, you, there's, uh, there's no way you could see it from where you are now. Oh, hi, Allison. And there's no way you could see from where you are right now. But if you, <laughs> in fact, now there's no way you'll be able to see it. But trust me, on there, there actually is not one, not two, but three different Dutch makers marks or, or, st or silver stamp marks on there. And so what I love about that is that you could see the top of this thing, right? I mean, it's really, really small. It's tiny. And so yet on each one of these, there's three different sort of pieces to it that went along with it. On, on an, each three, three different one, by law, the Dutch had to put little tiny marks on there to tell what it is. You know, one either like a maker mark, an export mark, and, and this one also has a sterling silver mark. And so sterling silver mark guaranteed by the inspector that it was sterling silver. 
Um, and so sterling silver means that it was 92.5% silver and the rest could be another alloy. Um, so, you know, 92.5%, that's pretty good. So when you, when you hear sterling silver, um, oh, you can see them, you can see the milks. Oh, oh, there. oh hey, Lindsay. Um, and so uh, what I love about this is that the Dutch, they were so meticulous and they were so uh, nerdy in their craftsmanship, which I love that they actually stamped on three different parts of this. So there you go. Elizabeth Monroe's perfume bottle. Um, perfume, again, really hasn't, uh, you know, the bottles and everything, there's a lot that still happens today. Perfumes have changed a bit. Um, the, the recipes were a little bit different back then. Um, in fact, on display right now, which um, maybe I can bring down uh, at a different uh, curator, uh, curator Live, is we have a vinaigrette, which is another way of dispersing smells. Because as you can imagine, Smells would have been a thing back then. Um, now, of course, obviously they would have been used to it. You're born, you, you accept the world into which you're born, so they wouldn't um, have known any better. But certainly there would have been times when the smells would have been more overpowering than others. So perfumes, uh, vinaigrettes, you know, things to sort of get rid of the smell um, would have helped a lot. And once again, the same with the, um, with the Nasser, same exact thing. This was also a bit of a status symbol. Um, if you had this, um, you would want a nice fancy crystal bottle. And um, you'd see a lot of these in, uh, in uh, the early 1800s. Okay, so uh, the last thing that I'm going to show you, and this is really pretty cool, one of my favorite pieces of the James Monroe collection here at the museum, this is really, really cool, is this is a cameo that was owned by Elizabeth Monroe. And I'll see if I can get a really good close look at this thing. Um, can you see that? It's absolutely beautiful. Oh, hey, Allison. Um, oh, oh, to answer your question, no, there's actually no scent left in there. Um, that's a great question, though, because some of those perfumes actually last a while, and certainly vinaigrettes can, uh, can last a while. Um, but no, there's no scents, uh, scent left in it. Um, I have heard stories of some from the late Victorian times, um, and uh, the, it, where the scents could still be still in there. I don't know if that's really true. I would take that with a grain of salt. Um, and, you know, some things uh, dissipate over time. Some things get better with, with age. It's like uh, uh, that movie with, uh, which says, uh, you know, the gunpowder, it only gets, it's like wine. It just gets better with age. Um, that's not really the case with uh, perfume. But, yeah, um, it definitely dissipated over time. But, anyway, so this cameo, I, I just love this thing, and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, it belonged to Elizabeth Monroe. Um, it's around uh, 1805. Uh, 1800, 1805, somewhere in there. And, um, oh, hey, Kristen. Hey, Jackie. Um, well, oh, oh, he's old, old. Yeah, it certainly does. Yeah, it definitely has that sort of look to it. Um, these cameos, you see these a lot of the old paintings, right? Um, there's these old paintings that were, you know, they had the cameos up. So these are very popular. Um, not quite as popular as they are back then. Um, they still do them now. I know the goth community wears them a lot. Um, and if people do it now, um, but uh, definitely back in the day, cameos were really a thing. And I'll tell you why that is, too. Um, cameos were sort of brought back into vogue by, uh, by Napoleon, um, in a way. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he had everything to do with it. But in a way, he sort of did. Um, and the reason for that is in the Napoleonic Wars, he was going into Italy in a lot of the sort of the classical, uh, in a lot of the classical lands. And when he would go in there with his wars, um, he was fascinated by the artifacts. And a lot of the things that he was fascinated by um, were the cameos that they carved. And so what that says, and so that actually sort of segues into the cameos have been around for thousands of years. Uh, 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 craftsmen have been carving them for thousands and thousands of years. And so uh, Napoleon was enamored by them. And more importantly, who was enamored by them, but Josephine. She loved cameos. So if uh, Josephine loved cameos and everyone loved cameos. So uh, cameos became more in vogue and more in fashion um, in the early 1800s. So it's kind of cool. Um, but anyway, what I love about these is, is not just the history of them, but how they were made. And I'll tell you how. So what they would do is the craftsmen would carve a piece out of a seashell. So what you're looking at right there is a seashell. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Um, this is actually a seashell. And, and, and so, well, it doesn't really look like a seashell. Well, what it is, is when you look at a seashell and you look at um, 
the uh, like a big one, like a conch shell, a conch shell. That's what they would usually come from, the conch shell. If you look at a big one, um, you see that there's actually many layers to them, right? It's not just one solid layer. If you look in them, there's actually the red outer layer um, and a white inner layer, or excuse me, the opposite, uh, the white outer layer, a red inner layer, or so on and so forth, depending on the shell. And so what the craftsmen would do is they would carve a larger chunk out. So maybe, hi, Tracy, how are you? Um, it carved a, a, maybe a larger one out from here, and they would uh, take that piece, and then they would take that piece of the shell, and they would put it on the end of a stick with tar. And so they would put it on the end of a stick with this tar sort of thing, and they would just start grinding. You see them, they have these big grind wheels that they would operate by hand. And this is how they would do it back in the day. And what's kind of cooler is this is how they do it today, too. So they would have it on these grinders, and they grind it down and grind it down to the shape that they want on the profile. So they would grind it to the profile there, and then they would take that stick and they would put it on the end of a, of a, of a, a vise, and they would put it into the vise, and they would start chipping away. And so they would chip away, hey, oh, hey, Brady, how are you? Nice to see you. All the way from Alexandria, very cool. Um, and so they would chip away, and they would start carving. And what they would do is they would carve and carve and carve, and down until they would get these different strata. And so this is all one piece. This is not a separate piece. It's not like they carved one thing and, and then glued it on the other. Nope. This is all the same piece. So they would carve it way into the white until they exposed this more orange part of it. And so what blows my mind about it is that they would have these um, until uh, <laughs> they would have these until uh, they would actually get to the clear spot. I don't know if you can see. Let me try to get a, a little bit of a better view here. So what you're seeing is a single piece with the white part left and then the orange part exposed. So this, folks, is master craftsmanship. That's about as good as it gets, if you think about it. And it was all done by hand. And what's cool about this is that today, if you go and watch a cameo maker, hi, Robin. Oh, yeah. Want to see the back of the cameo? Sure. There's the back of it. There's really nothing, so to speak, on it. So this is just sort of worn to show the front, but I don't know if, if you can see that pretty well. So here's the front, and then there's the back. Yeah. So, but what is really cool about this is if you go to the makers in Italy today, they do the exact same thing. So you'll see them in their workshops to this day, using the cutting out, using the old tar a stick, and they put it on there, and they just kind of carve it around and carve it around. And uh, they would, <laughs> and then they would carve it down to the uh, to get the relief. Um, this is also some people could call these relieves and everything like that, but this you know in particular is a cameo. Um, so anyway, uh, that's what I have to show you today. I'm so glad that you do join me. Let me give you another look for those that are joining in a little bit later. I'll give you another look. Here's Elizabeth Monroe's Nasser, and uh, this is in the cartouche style and cartouche if i'm not mistaken is the italian word for cartridge and it's sort of shaped like a bullet cartridge kind of interesting um oh yeah the clasp robin yeah that's that's a good point um you know it's interesting a lot of the clasps that you see in jewelry back in the day they're not that different than they are now you know just simple little tiny things in fact maybe in the next curator live i can bring in some of uh, uh elizabeth monroe's jewelry and I could show you a little bit closer some of those clasps that, you, that you're talking about. It's really, it's really pretty much the same as it was then. And, in, and just to sort of recap with the Nasser, we have a spoons, little nerdy spoons, little tiny spoons, knife and fork set, <laughs> which I just think is the coolest thing ever. Knife and fork. And then the text pad of, of, the, of the 1800s, uh, which is a slab of ivory that they would write on, uh, they would write graphic uh, notes on them to each other. And maybe next time I could show you the memo tattoo. And then of course the peaceful resistance, my absolute favorite, the ear scoop, which I just love this thing. <laughs> I love the fact that they used to scoop their ears out with it. It's just the coolest thing ever. Um, so there's that. And then Finally, the perfume bottle, which I showed you earlier, made out of crystal. And Oh, Kristen, that's a good question. You're asking why, why is it so small? Um, it's because they had to fit in this little tiny Nasser piece to carry around. So it's sort of like a Swiss army knife in a sense. 
you know, in the Swiss Army knife, you see, you know, the little tiny blades, the little tiny scissors, that sort of thing. It's just sort of a way to carry. Um, some questions I get about this actually is like, how often did they use them? Well, I mean, it would depends on the person, right? Like a lot of us have Swiss Army knives. How often do we use them? Um, I use mine all the time. I use that little scissors all the time. Some people carry them around. They don't use them ever. Um, in fact, you, you, you actually see a lot of uh, some Victorian uh, photos of women carrying these in chains and everything. They actually had chains that they would dig down. It sort of reminds me of uh, the kids for a while were doing the, the chains around their jeans. I don't know if they still do it or not. Um, but yeah, so that, that's the reason why they're so small is because they have to sort of all fit in a little tiny, little tiny Nasser. Um, well, anyway, uh, I've really enjoyed talking with you guys. Um, that is my, uh, my curator live today. Um, the next time I can show you some different things. Um, at some point, maybe we can tour around the museum a little bit, but we have so many cool artifacts to show you. And I know everyone is, is chipping in and, and doing, um, uh, social distancing and, and doing their parts and that's what we're doing here where we're close to the public so in lieu of that I can show you some of this stuff to your home live and uh, we really appreciate it and, and and if you get a chance if you could please go to the James Monroe Museum page and, and maybe give us a like um, uh, that would that would help us a lot and uh, and, and and share it if you could um, so anyway uh, hey Brady thank you so much um, I'll see you all next time and uh, stay healthy and stay safe all right bye we can turn this off.